The sewing machine was really the first machine of any sort to enter the home. When it first appeared in the 1850s, it was regarded as the miracle of its age. To the people of the time, it must have seemed almost inconceivable that a machine could do such a fiddly and complicated action as sewing that I find quite difficult enough with both hands and a lot of concentration. Personally, I still find sewing machines quite magical, how effortlessly they work, producing such perfect stitches and without hardly ever tangling up. To make a machine that directly imitated hand sewing would be very difficult. The real secret of machine sewing has been to find a completely different sort of stitch that's more suitable. The first clues came from a sort of embroidery decoration popular in the 18th century. This used the hook needle and formed a so-called chain stitch. The needle never needs to go right through the fabric so it can be firmly fixed to part of a machine at the top. The first attempts at mechanical sewing imitated this embroidery stitch. The first patent was granted to Thomas Saint, an English cabinet maker, in 1790. When a model was made from his drawings a hundred years later, it had to be extensively modified before it would work so it's doubtful whether Saint ever actually built one. The first person to build a sewing machine and put it to any practical use was a French tailor called Thimonier. After years of failure, he finally patented a machine in 1830. By 1841, he had 80 machines stitching army clothing in a Paris factory. An angry crowd of tailors, fearing that the invention would rob them of their livelihood, then broke into the factory and destroyed the machines. Timonier was ruined and eventually died penniless. This is a model of Thimonier's machine in the Science Museum, which exactly imitates the hand embroidery stitch. We're having some trouble in uh, making it stitch, but uh, we have got to make, made it do a few stitches. Put it off, I think. Back again. Back again. Okay. Okay. This is working better. We haven't managed to make it stitch very neatly, but even if the machine was properly set up, chain stitch still has the disadvantage that it's very easily pulled apart. Unknown to Thimonier, other inventors were experimenting with a different sort of stitch, lock stitch, using two separate reels of cotton. The machines were more complicated, but the stitches they produced were neater and uh, they didn't pull apart so easily. The secret of these machines was really the brilliant shape of the needle itself. We've made a giant one here, and you can see the eye is in the pointed end of the needle, and it has a groove all the way up one side that the thread can slip through. Well, with a real needle, if I push it through a bit of uh, cotton and pull it out again, it automatically leaves a loop underneath and all the machine needs to form a stitch is to pass the second reel of cotton through the loop. The first lock stitch machine was built in America by an inventor called Walter Hunt in about 1833. It didn't work very well so he lost interest and didn't even bother to patent it. Elias Howe patented an improved machine in 1845 and despite an initial lack of interest this then acted as a catalyst to other American inventors, and within 10 years, all the major elements of a modern sewing machine had been introduced. I'm going to try and demonstrate these with this human sewing machine, stitching together two sheets of expanded polystyrene. The needle goes through the material, 
the bottom bobbin is pushed through the loop, the needle comes out and the stitch is pulled tight and the material is pulled forward. Every lock stitch machine has these four movements. Pushing through the needle, passing the loop round the bobbin, pulling the stitch tight and moving the material forward. The movements are all connected to the motor by a series of ingenious mechanical linkages. First, the linkage to the needle itself. This is often just a crank the simplest way to get an up and down motion from a rotation. Next, the device that pulls the stitch tight. This is basically an arm that flies up at the right moment, just as Ellie's was doing. But Ellie also had to grip the thread with her other hand to stop the thread being pulled from the reel instead of through the stitch. So on a sewing machine, there's a sort of friction pulley between the cotton reel and the arm. It's getting the thread to pass cleanly through these two things before the needle that always makes threading up a machine so elaborate. The action of the arm itself is surprisingly simple. Just two levers fixed to the needle mechanism. It's wonderful what a vast range of movements can be derived from simple cranks and levers. These are some collecting boxes I made for the Science Museum. They're actually portraits of people who work here. The idea was to show exactly what a donation would fund, so a pound makes them work for 10 times long as 10p. This is the curator. He takes the pipe out of his mouth and then scratches his head. If you look inside, you can see the arm is a simple crank connected to a geared motor. Back to the sewing machine. The next action is passing the thread loop round the bobbin. This is what Ian was doing in the human sewing machine. To me, this is the most magical part, how it manages to do it without tangling up. On a real machine, instead of passing the bobbin through the loop, the bobbin stays still and a sort of rotating hook pulls the loop so it's large enough to pass right over the bobbin. With the bobbin back in place, all you can actually see is the red thread slipping round the outside. The last movement, pulling the cloth forward for the next stitch, is technically called a four-motion feed because the toothed metal bit moves forward, down, backwards and up again. <laughs> 